If L1 and L2 are context-free languages, we proved their union was also a context-free language by creating a context-free grammar that recognized their union. Next, we'll prove that the concatenation of two context-free languages is also a context-free language. We'll do this by assigning it as a homework problem. But here's a hint. If SC is the start symbol of the concatenated language, then we'll use the rule SC produces S1, S2, the start symbols of the two languages being concatenated. What about the closure of a context-free language? We'll let the four tuple G be the context-free grammar for our language. Then a context-free grammar for our closure could be where we need to figure out what the new variables, terminal symbols, start symbol, and production rules are. So we note that an element of the closure is going to have the form x1, x2, and so on, where each of the xi's is part of our original language. So this means it will make use of the same terminal symbols. And so we can make our set of terminal symbols the same as our original set. Now, since a string in our closure might not be a string in our language, we need a new start symbol. What about the production rules? Suppose x is in our star closure, then x is the concatenation of some number of strings from our language. But since each of the xi's is in our language, then we know that starting from our start symbol in the language, we can produce each xi for all i. And since these all use the same production rules, we don't need to change our variables though we do need to include our new start symbol. Finally, we'll need a production rule to take us from the start symbol of our concatenated language to the start symbol of our language. If we want the start symbol to produce a string in our language, the obvious rule is, but there could be any number of s's. So we'd actually need an infinite number of production rules of the form s star produces s, produces ss, produces sss, and so on. But remember, do one thing at a time. Note that if a string is in our star closure, we can write it as a string in L concatenated with a string in our star closure. So we can use the production rule s star produces s s star. Now there is one important thing to remember. Nothing is important. Note that unless we have a rule that takes s star to alpha, where alpha is a terminal symbol, we can't eliminate the variable s star. So that means we also need a rule s star produces the empty string. Now it's important to remember that the first answer you write down can never be changed and you must keep it until the end of time. Or you could revise as necessary. And there is one little problem here. Since L star is a concatenation of any number of elements of L, it's possible that the empty string is in the star closure because we might take no elements at all. But at the same time, it's possible that the empty string is not in the original language. And so we might need to expand our set of terminal symbols to include the empty string. Now, to prove this is a context-free grammar for L star, we need to show that if x is in L star, then S star produces x. And likewise, if S star produces x, then x must be in L star. First, let's prove that if x is in our closure, then S star produces x. Note that this is the same as saying S star produces x for all x in our closure. But this is also the same as saying S star produces x for all x in L. It produces x for all x in L2 it produces x for all x in L3, and so on. 
And this is an infinite ordered list of statements, so we'll need an induction proof. First, let's prove our base step. Suppose x is in L. Then x is in L star by the production. So S star produces x for all x in L. Now suppose that S star produces x for all x in L k. Consider some string in L k plus 1. Since x is in L k plus 1, we can write it as x1 x k, where x1 is in L and x k is in L k. We can then use the production. And so s star produces x for all x in L k plus 1, which completes our induction step. Now remember Gauss's dictum. Let's prove it another way. Our actual goal is to show that if we have a context-free language, its closure is also a context-free language. We can do this if we can show that L star has a context-free grammar. So, as before, L has a context-free grammar, which proves our base step. Our induction step is to prove that if LK is a context-free grammar, then LK plus 1 is a context-free grammar. So suppose LK has context-free grammar, but L also has a context-free grammar, and we know how to form the concatenation of two context-free grammars, or at least we would know if we did the homework. And the corresponding language will be the concatenation of LK and L. So LK plus 1 will be a context-free grammar, and so it'll be a context-free language. Now let's look at it from the other direction. Suppose S star produces X. Now repeated application of our production rule will give us S star produces S concatenated with it some number of times. There's an induction proof needed here, but we'll leave that as homework. And at this point, since each of these is the starting symbol in our language, then S produces XI and so S star produces a concatenation of strings in L, and so it produces something that's in L star. Put together with our previous result on the union of CFLs, we note that the union, concatenation, and closure of any number of context-free languages is a context-free language. So let's see how we can use that next.